All right. Real happy to have my next guest on the one of one card shop guest line. I was his guest uh, during Hobby Palooza uh, a few months back. And so uh, it's time to return the favor. Uh, gentlemen, he's, a, he's around my age and uh, we share a lot of uh, uh, the same interests. And I've uh, been looking forward to having him on. I told him he was on my list. He reached out to me. So it was uh, serendipity. But uh, without further ado, uh, YouTube sensation, I'll call him, uh, Mike, uh, a.k.a. Uh, baseball Collector. Mike, welcome. Yo, and hello, everybody. What's up? Hey, I, I, how are you? First thing I want to say, I know you're in Texas. Uh, you know, uh, you know how was that? I know you had a rough snap with the, with the cold weather, and, you know, you're, you're making it through, hopefully unscathed. I know some didn't. And, yeah, not unscathed. I mean, again, our infrastructure down here is just not used to literally sub-zero temperatures, and that's uh, what we had yeah. for, and it, you can have it for a day, but we had it for about two weeks where it was below freezing, con like nonstop, and a couple days where it got below zero, and, and so we lost... Uh, I have a ranch house. Everybody in Texas has a ranch. Not really, but I do. And uh, we lost some pipes out there. And so we don't, we still don't have water out there because uh, getting a plumber is like, forget about it. It's crazy. Yeah. Trying to get a plumber. They're all busy. Everybody yeah. had most pipes. So. Yeah, it's crazy. I know uh, Dr. Beckett, uh, even listening to his show, he said he had a bunch of busted pipes. So uh, plumbers obviously raking in the, uh, the dough. I mean, uh, at someone else's uh, unfortunate uh, circumstances, but uh, you know, you're, you're breathing, you're alive, you're you're. We're talking cards, so uh, I guess it could be it could be worse. You know, all all things considered. So, amen to that. Uh, John. Now you're you're now when it comes to YouTube, I'm I'm a novice. You're you're an eight year uh, veteran. Like what you know, just kind of you know how you got if you want to kind of combine like you're starting a hobby and then, you know, when you launch your, your YouTube channel. Yeah. So a lot like you, um, well, I was born in 73, started in the hobby really in 1981. Uh, I know you started in 79, uh, yeah. but I, I was a couple years behind you both in life and in the hobby, but 40 years now in the hobby. Right. I mean, and I never Crazy. stopped. I never had one of those periods where I didn't collect. A lot of people do, you know, they take respites yeah. from the hobby. I wasn't one of those guys. I always collected certainly less than there were periods of less collecting just from a mon monetary standpoint. We were, I was a broke college student for a while, but I've always loved the hobby. And I remember, you know, opening packs of 81 Donruss, 81 Fleer, you know, it was a kind of an interesting year to join the hobby because it was no longer a tops monopoly, right? You had yeah. Flair and Donruss join. And I remember just putting the cards by team on my floor in my room and rubber bands and shoe boxes and nobody yeah. cared about yeah. condition. I didn't care. And I wanted the Rangers. I'm a Texas guy, big Rangers fan. Uh, so I, I always collected and I was a player collector for a really long time. A player, my first super collection of player of a player collector was Daryl Strawberry. For some reason, I just like Daryl Strawberry. I know you're a Mets guy, so uh, yeah, I was gonna say that's about as far from Texas as she can get with, with collecting the players with, with yeah. Strawberry, an yeah, LA guy who who got drafted by the by the Mets. So you had West Coast, East Coast, and and it's funny how you you navigated to him. What what do you think it was? Just the uh, I just, just liked the, the way he talent. played. I thought he was flamboyant and could had a great swing, that beautiful swing of his, and could launch a ball. That skinny frame, you know, I was like, yeah. how can a skinny guy like that just crush the ball like he does? I don't know. I just liked – I was always attracted to home run hitters because then I moved on to Juan Gonzalez and Ruben Sierra. I kind of gravitated towards some Ranger players, Pudge Rodriguez, Um then I started collecting, super collecting like Michael Young, and then finally Josh Hamilton. And Josh Hamilton was who, who cured me from being a player collector, let me tell you. <laughs> because I put tens of thousands of dollars into Josh Hamilton stuff, and I still have it all. I have literally hundreds of one-of-ones and you name it. I was yeah. a super, super pl player collector. 
of Josh Hamilton just because I watched him in the 2008 home run derby and I saw him hit balls that I did no other human being I think could hit mm -hmm. in that home run derby. And when Yankee Stadium is chanting your name, you know, that's pretty cool. And I that night became a Josh Hamilton super collector and I went nuts on his stuff. And obviously his career did not pan out the way he wanted to. His story of redemption was great. And that's turned into a story of continuing screw ups. And his career just went down the tubes. And I realized I had all this cardboard of that was basically not worthless, but worth less than I paid for it. And yeah. I felt like, God, that's such a waste. And I've always loved, I've always been a hall of famer fan, hall of fame fan for sure. Loved collecting the occasional autograph, the occasional card of hall of famers. It's not that I didn't like them. I just player collected mostly. And then after the Josh Hamilton thing, I realized, God, I'm just going to collect the greats. I'm just going to collect all the greatest guys. And I, I went to a, a Rangers event and Fergie Jenkins was there and he was signing and it was 20 bucks donation to his charity there. Yeah. And I thought, golly, I wonder how many hall of famers I can get for 20 bucks, you know, and I started searching eBay and all of this turns out back then, at least this is, you know, uh, early 2010s, 20, uh, 2010, 2011, man, you could get a lot of Hall of Famers for 20 bucks or less. And I was like, this is the way to do it because they're always a Hall of Famer. They don't, they can't. Yeah, you can't, can't take that off. back. Yeah, you can't, you know, uh, once once and always, once and forever. And yeah. so that really appealed to me a lot. Uh, the earliest memory of being a Hall of Fame fan was the 83 Donruss Hall of Fame Heroes set by Dick Perez. He did that yeah. 40 card set. I have all of those that can be signed I have them signed. I've gotten those over the years and completed that set and just found that to be much more joyful. And not, not that I do the hobby. I've never done the hobby for money, but you got to think about it. You can't ignore yeah. the financial aspect of it. If you do, you're just going to end up uh, screwing over your family. And I don't want to do that later down the road, hopefully a long time down the road, but yeah. at some point. And so, I just really started focusing on Hall of Famer stuff. And then I started, you know, trying to get some runs of some different players that I really like, Mantle and Aaron and Mays. And then I said, well, shoot, I started going, hey, how about from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s on every Topps card and Bowman card that a Hall of Famer is pictured, get all of those in slabs. And so that is my current lunatic project that I'm working on, you know, 2,500, 2,600, however many cards it is. And I'm up to like 70% of them already. Uh, and so, again, those have all done very well, obviously, in this ho hobby environment today. And uh, But again, that wasn't the reason I did it. It's just a nice ancillary benefit. And so around 2013, I, I'd been watching YouTube for a couple of years. And I enjoyed watching hobby content. And I thought, man, I, I can do this, you know. Uh, and I got some cool stuff. Let me start showing it off. And so I did some videos sporadically. And then really late 2017, early 2018, I guess, I really went hog wild into YouTube. I've probably got 800 videos out there between an old channel of mine called Baseball Collector. That's my that's my yeah. moniker. I have a channel with that that's still active. I just don't post new stuff on it. And then I joined Bench Clear Media, yeah. which is a kind of group of guys Tyson yep. from Breaker Culture or Ty from Breaker Culture and Pat Geek and Jam and JD and Up North Collectors, a bunch of guys that contribute. We've kind of got this group of guys together that can contribute content to it. And I uh, just really enjoy being part of that because it was kind of like people ask me all the time, why'd you stop doing Baseball Collector? And it's like, well, I'm still doing it. I'm just doing it on yeah. another channel, really. Yeah, I'm, I'm still me. Yeah, I'm still you me. Know, and I wanted to be part of something different. You know, I could I could keep doing my own videos in perpetuity forever, but that wasn't really getting me excited. And and I I'd kind of again 600 plus videos on the old channel. I'm like, okay, I've been there, done that. Let me try something <laughs> different, and yeah. let's see if we can't grow something that's unique in the hobby through Bench Clear Media. And we've done that. We've launched. We have several podcasts that are part of that YouTube channels. I've started my own podcast called Golden Age of Cardboard, which I really enjoy doing, which I never would have done I without the 
collaborative effect of working with some other guys like Ty that have helped me do that. So it's really just reignited my passion for content creation and sharing knowledge and all of those things that us old time collectors like to do. We, you know, uh, we like to talk about that and, and we mean it like, it's not just a, we're not just saying it, it's legit. And, and hopefully yeah. that's get from my channel. So. Yeah, well, that's awesome, man. And like you said, you know, if you're still producing content, whether whatever it's under, it's still you, it's still your experiences, it's still your journey in the hobby. Uh, and uh, nothing wrong with that. And uh, doing doing well, obviously. And like you said, launching uh, Golden Age of Cardboard. And uh, so you got the audio, you got the the visual, uh, visual. You know, you got you got all the bases covered. I started in audio just because I was always told I had a face hey, for, for radio, radio. Yeah, <laughs> so, and and I believe it. And and I look in the mirror, so I, I do like come to the realization. But uh, you know, all joking aside, I, I you know, Josh, you mentioned Josh Hamilton, and I knew that about you. And I'm I'm one of those guys. I believe in in second chances and. And you like to see people who kind of, uh, you know, take a, you know, turn their life around. And, and like you said, he did. And then he sort of re reverted back. It's that old cautionary tale. And, and you know, like you said, you sort of learn from that to maybe, uh, you know, take the sort of safer road with, with those guys that did it already, uh, the greats and the Hall of Famers. And you, you can't go wrong there. Like you said, once you're in the Hall of Fame, they, they can't uh, strip your title uh, away from you. And uh, I like to do that myself. So uh, I, I get it. And, uh, you know, uh, but, uh, I, you know, I also respect you for, for, you know, we all like for me, it's Jackie Robinson being a, a Brooklyn kid. Uh, you know, even Maddenly, I wasn't, uh, I was a Yankee fan when I was real young and then Steinbrenner sort of ruined that whole experience for me. And I just kind of went over to the Mets full time, but Munson, uh, for me, uh, was another guy. He was the, you know, I always tell the story. That's probably the first time, uh, I cried over someone dying and here it is. No one I'm related to. It's just, uh, uh an athlete I admired at a young age. And, uh, it's the first time. Uh, I was really taught kind of what death was, you know, uh, I, I saw the news uh, come across the, the TV and it didn't hit me at, at, you know, six, seven years old or, you know, and I asked my grandfather, like, you know, Dermot Munson died. I was kind of asking like, what does that mean almost? And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't even remember the exact words, but basically, you know, he, he filled in the blanks that, uh, you know, he's, He's not here anymore, and uh, and that's when it hit me, and it really like sank in. Like yeah, I won't get to see him, you know, behind the plate, and uh, that's the end. You know, I wasn't even necessarily thinking heaven or anything like that. It was just we're not going to see him play no more. And uh, that was the first player I ever, you know, uh, really got emotional about at a very young age, and uh, and learned. To, it's funny. You usually, as a young youngster. You learned about death from, a, unfortunately, like a family member usually passing away. And here, my story is a little different, you know. And uh, uh, but uh, went to the Mets, and uh, they've had their own, you know. You mentioned one in Strawberry and Gooden, and uh, with uh, issues uh, outside the uh, outside the sport that affected, you know, two guys that probably should be in the Hall of Fame themselves, and uh, got sidetracked. Uh, buy those things and it's always it's always sad but uh you know uh like you said the the greatness of both of them aren't aren't really is not arguable it's it's just they the, the things that happen off the field that uh shorten their career uh and and how they were looked at but uh you know it is what it is and and we you know we've we've pivoted to to do uh what you know different things and uh you know uh, I appreciate that. So, you know, you mentioned the state of the hobby and uh, it's a, it's, it's an inferno right now. It's just almost everything uh, that, that can go up in price as we're seeing, you know, you mentioned you're one of the few uh, and it, it is rare where you, like you said, I, I didn't really have that get out period, you know, even myself where uh, I'm 11 months older than you. I mentioned when my son, who's 21 now, but when he was younger, 
I had a three, four, five-year period, Mike, where I didn't necessarily get out, but I wasn't active. Like what I had, I had. I wasn't acquiring anything new. I wasn't selling anything. It was just, it was like hitting pause, you know, uh, on the play, you know, on the, on the stereo, just hitting pause on the CD for, you know, I'd say probably about four or five years. Then when my son got a little bit older where we could kind of share in some stuff together, I kind of hit play again. And, uh, you know, where, you know, so even, even myself for, you know, I, I don't even think I have 40, maybe, with that pause, you know, 36 years or whatever, long time, any way you slice it. But, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of guys that did leave for longer periods of time. You're seeing now get back in because th this, this stuff's making it mainstream. It's on financial news networks. It's on regular news networks. And guys are coming back. And, and I shouldn't say guys, but people are coming back. And they're trying to acquire those cards, those iconic cards they remember. I just did a, a show on the Hobby Quick Hits, the, my shorter show, where I talked about some of those cards. You know, the the Bo Jackson with his football pads and he's he shirtless, and the the Jordan SP one out of ninety one upper deck, and and you know uh, those cards of those ilk that at the time, you know, you could find in the dollar boxes, two dollar boxes. They kind of the market kind of got soft on them and you know there's no shortage of them it's they're not short prints per se and now those those folks are coming back looking for those cards and we see those things rising up from from the ashes again so to speak to to use a you know a, a dramatic term and those things you know the bow's going about 15 20 bucks the jordan sp1 is insane right now uh, you know i i just talked about selling five ninety one upper deck sealed boxes for seven hundred seventy five dollars. That's what the buyer pit, you know. Um, right. I mean, it's just in, insane. You, you know, you're just kind of take on on you know uh, everything going on, and and not just necessarily about those cards, but just just the hobby in general right now. Yeah, it's a frenzy is the word I use a lot, and because everybody's just trying to grab everything. And unfortunately, some of those people are going to get left holding the bag on that deal down the road. Yeah. Overall, is it good for is the is what's going on good for the hobby? The, I think the answer is unknown. We don't know what the hobby is going to look like in five years. It may be just doing great, and it may be a repeat of the junk wax era, which we were both a part of, and. Yeah. I loved, I don't care. I guess that's the hardest thing for me is, dude, I'm in this hobby for, I've been in it 40 years. I hope I'm in it another 40 years. I'll be an old, old man then. But, you know, there's this thing going on. There's these, there's this confluence of situation and circumstances that is making this frenzy absolutely real. And it totally makes sense. And I had this kind of epiphany about it a number of weeks ago and did a video about it actually, because we have this thing that's happening right now called first thing. There's kind of three things that I think are happening and there's, there's more than these three things, but there's probably 30 things that are contributing to it. But there's a, there's an idea called the wealth effect and I'm a financial planner is my job. And so I think about money and behavioral finance and all these things all the time. I deal with it every day. And the wealth effect is basically an, a behavioral theory that suggests that people spend more as the value of their assets rise. So, Think about this, John, if you have a home, you have your 401k at work, all of these different things that are just, you're looking at them on paper and they're they're just growing and you're like, wow, I'm worth more money. You feel better, right? You, you don't necessarily yeah. have a higher income. You're still making the same amount of money. You still probably have the same budgetary constraints and same expenses, but you feel wealthier and that causes people to unconsciously spend more money, whether they, because they just feel like I'm better off. And the stock market's helped with that lately. The, you know, the home market has helped with that. People just feel wealthier and that wealth effect is real and people just spend more. And usually when they spend that extra, that, that more money, they're spending it on things that aren't necessities like rent and food and gas and all that, that kind of stuff. That's real. That's a real thing. And it's happening 
and it's happening and, and coming into sports cards. Then you've got this idea of found money, which I think is a huge part of this. And found money, I think, comes, you can break that down into two ways. Number one, let me, found money. Think about this, John. If you are walking down the street and you see a $20 bill on the ground and you pick it up and you've found that money, you're thinking, man, I'm taking the wife out to Sizzler tonight or something. You know, you're thinking, how can I, this is extra money. I'm going to have fun with it, right? You, you found it. You didn't have to earn it. You weren't out digging ditches to earn it. And so your 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 as, your mental aspect towards that money is different. Your frame of mind is different towards found money versus if you had to go and dig ditches for an hour to earn $20, man, that's going towards bills. I got to be really smart how I spend that. And we've got two sources of found money in the hobby right now. Number one is, let's think about it. We've Believe it or not, most people are still working in America despite COVID. I know there are a lot of people that are struggling and, and the stimulus checks are huge for them to, to keep their lifestyle. I get it. But by and large, Americans are still working and earning an income and they can't do as much to spend it as they normally would because of COVID. And therefore, they're finding alternative ways to spend it. And they get these extra stimulus checks. And I've heard it time and time again, as I'm sure you have, people are spending at least part of that money, if not all of it, yeah. on sport. They're like, hey, I dug out my sports card collection during COVID, yada, yada. And I started buying some stuff. And they don't know, these new people coming back in the hobby don't know that that $20 card should really only probably be a $5 card. They just see it and they buy it and they go, all right, that's what they go yeah. for. Okay, $20, whatever. And then the second part of found money, which I think is huge, huge, huge. So many people that are in the hobby and have been in the hobby are seeing the rise in prices, this meteoric soaring of prices. And they they take their card that they paid $10 for and they sell it for 100 And they had to do nothing more than put it on eBay. So they have a $90 profit. That is, that is another part of fast found money that now if I have this profit, I'm more willing and apt to go spend that on, a, reinvest that into the hobby because it's hobby money. I I only put in 10 bucks. It's like winning it at the casino. You're playing with yeah. house money, right? You're like, man, I'm I'm good to go. I'll bet more than I would normally bet, you know, at that casino with, with house money. If it's not my money, I'll bet all day, right? I'll bet with other people's money all day long. And that's what we're doing with, that's what is happening transaction after transaction and imagine the multiplicative effect of that throughout the entire hobby you selling box even wax right you, you man i bought this wax for 50 bucks and now i sold it for 500 great that's 500 more dollars i can put in the hobby and you will yeah. again unconsciously spend more on other other things because you didn't really do anything to earn the money other than post it on eBay or sell it privately through Facebook or whatever. It you didn't have to work for it. It just kind of fell yeah. into your pocket. And so we spend that differently. Does that all make sense? Does that do you agree with that? Like does that no I, I think yeah I think you you you're right on with it uh Mike I think and and listen I can uh, I don't know about you but I, I can speak I can test you know self confessional I've done that. I think we probably, most of us have, you know, uh, you, you do, you know, you sell something, like you said, let's say I have $50 in it and I sell it. Like you mentioned 500, you feel like you, you sort of, you know, the, the, the momentum swings your way and like, Hey, that card that was sort of on my list that I was kind of just putting off. I'm, I'm going to go look for it now and see, you know, still try to get the best deal on it and be, you know, be uh, smart about it, but uh, I'm more apt to pull the trigger, like you said, than before that sale occurred, obviously. And, uh, you you know, you, you sort of lose those inhibitions that you might have had uh, without them. And uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think, you, you know, the stimulus checks is something I've talked about on this show, Mike, is is those, uh, you know, not not so much even me personally. We did get a hot tub this year. Uh, that, that's where some of our stimulus money went. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, maybe if you're a single guy and cards are your thing and, you, and you're and you working and you get that stimulus check and you're not necessarily behind on your bills and that's just, frankly, extra bonus money uh, that you can put in any direction you want, 
I think, like you said, I think that a lot of it's going into the to the hobby. Like, hey, there's fourteen hundred bucks. My, you know, my rent's paid. My mortgage is paid for this month. Uh, my fridge is full. And uh, what cards do I want? What do I want to open? What cards do I want to buy? And like you said, it's that's happening. That's not a, just a random thing. I think it's a very common thing and, and you got a lot of people doing that like you said uh you know i think you mentioned called it the perfect storm i think you got a lot of different things happening at the same time if you remember those that seen that movie uh will know what we're talking about you had three different things coming in and you mentioned a few diff all different things now you also have some people who are working from home there's like you said they're, they're still employed but they don't have to travel to an office and let's be real Right. Uh, I heck I do it at work. So you know if you're at home, you're you're maybe looking, you got that eBay tab open as well on your, you know, along with your Microsoft Office and just quickly like open it up and hit the search, you know, type in something to search. And so more downtime, or if you will, to to make those purchases than you would under normal uh times. Uh and, and there's uh, a, there's another thing, you know, the, the so we got the wealth effect affecting it this perfect storm you've got the found money idea with the different components there but john this is for real man wall street is paying attention and there yeah. is serious money coming in yeah. oh yeah here yeah. in the united states and even more so there is a wave of cash coming from china and other overseas places where money is coming in to buy sports cards as assets as investments i'm not a big sports cards as investments kind of guy. I don't, I look at it as a hobby, as a collectible. And yeah. those are, that doesn't mean you can't make money in collectibles, but I don't look at them as an investment and, you know, to each their own. If you think that way, that's fine. But there is, believe me, when there's money to be made, Wall Street's going to pay attention and there are funds being created and uh, groups being created, investment groups with all they're doing is buying sports cards. You see it now manifesting itself with collectible and, rally and all these different places that are yeah. auctioning off shares selling off shares of huge sports cards i think it's an absolute you know novelty and like why would i want to own a piece of a card i want to own the card like i don't yeah need one now share. full yeah. disclosure like i i do them i just dabble in them uh, i'm not putting a ton of money in there it's, it's sort of that you know disposable like i said uh, one of the cards for for jackie that uh uh, I've never acquired, and it's my own fault. I, I had opportunities, yeah. And Brilliant. so that that came that came up on the fractional market, and I bought, I think, you know, four or five shares of it. And again, it's not, you know, I'm not, I don't have the card. I, I get it, um, but it's probably unless I buy a, you know, a very very poor copy, uh, and probably have to do that sooner than later. Um, you know, that's probably the closest I'm going to get. And so, you know, I have a, a sentiment. It's more sentimental. I'm not, I'm not foolish. And I'm not, you know, I know I don't have the card. I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not under false uh, pretenses. I know what it is. Uh, but, you know, even with these fractionals too, Mike, is, is some of these folks are doing it, not necessarily me, uh, but some of these folks are doing it just to turn around and, and, you know, Buy share at twenty bucks, and and when the card sells at a certain level, I'll get forty two dollars a share, and so you know that's two hundred percent over uh, two hundred percent ROI. And so some people, like you, I, I, now I will say this: the, the cards are an asset class; they can be an investment. Uh, I didn't get you know when I like you said, and I got started in seventy nine as a seven year old kid. I was not thinking that. And I still don't necessarily think that that's not where my main interest lies. But, you know, I've also been a store owner and I started doing shows at age 15. So the month, you know, to, to be fully transparent, it, the, the money's sort of been a part of, of the hobby. But uh, I didn't get in. I didn't get in it for that reason. And if the money stopped, like you said, uh, I'd still be here. So it's just kind of goes along uh, with it. But, uh, you know, like you said, if the market crashed, uh, I'm still going to be in the hobby and, and same here. I feel the same, uh, same way. And I get that question a lot. I'm sure you do is like, 
How does this end? Is the bottom going to fall out? Is there going to be is it going to be a correction rather than a crash? Which I as where I my answer falls is it's more going to be things are going to come kind of come back down. You know where you mentioned like hey this card really should be five bucks but it's twenty right now. I think you'll see that stuff kind of go back and like you said some folks probably going to be holding that bag and you know that's you know that's going to be on them and 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 you know so i i see it as a correction uh i don't see the, the hobby's too strong there's there's too many people even if there was a little bit of an exodus of people that leave um i think the the strength of the hobby even pre-pandemic sort of was the buffer to 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 fuel uh what what you said that those things that uh have factored into people buying more cards getting in the hobby that overseas money coming in and now you see, you know you see these high end auctions and and a lot of that some of that is some overseas money some of that is just what i call pandemic proof folks well, millionaires and billionaires who you know you know I, it's true the pandemic shortest short of illness uh is not going to affect those folks financially so they can spend 5.2 million dollars on a mickey mantle card where me and you uh, no such luck. So um, it's just, uh, you know, it's just a crazy, you just got, you know, you, you said it, there's just so many, it's not, you know, a lot of years you can say it's this thing. It's one thing. I, I know what it is. There's a lot of, I know what it is. is and, and everything you said, I actually agree with. I think you, you, you hit it right on the head and it's just, like you said, the perfect storm, you got all sorts of different torrents and currents and uh, just all together it's just you know got this thing it's an inferno right now and we see it bounce you know it's yeah. it's it goes to vintage and now it's in the marvel and then wrestling cards blew up and uh you know if you if you're smart and you can do your homework and and get in on whatever's next before it actually gets there you're gonna make you know let's be real you're gonna make some money and and you know it's uh it's just a crazy time. Yeah, and I better clarify. It's not that I don't think people can't use cards as an investment, as an asset class. I just don't think that's – it's just a personal yeah. opinion. It's a personal take on it. There are people doing it, no doubt, and they're yeah. totally looking at it that way. So, And I, what I think that creates is a sustainability to this for the next few years. Um, it would be shocking to me if something happened before that. And you can you even imagine what this may be a good segue to our next topic, but can you even imagine what the national is going to be like this year if it happens in Chicago with the frenzy of the sports can, market? It's going to be yeah, nuts. it's I, I, it is going to be insane. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing things, you know, uh, I'm sure you're hearing the same things. Maybe it gets moved or, or bumped a little bit later. Um, I, I would not be opposed to that. I would love to go to Texas. And I've never been. Um, I've heard it's I, moving either to Dallas. They're looking into moving it to Dallas or Houston because yeah. our COVID constraints are significantly less than other than Chicago, let's say. And so like down here, I mean, yeah, people are wearing masks, but by, yeah. by July, it's going to be now. Can they logistically do that? I don't know if the national could pull that off. And I'm not saying that, that I, I, these are just rumors that I've heard. I know nothing concrete at all. Yeah. This isn't a breaking story or anything. I'm just saying breaking that this just in, no, I, but I have, I've heard <laughs> from people that do know what's going on, yeah. that, that they are at least discussing it. And yeah. that would be great for me. There hasn't been, I, the last uh, national here was in 1990 and I went to it. Uh, it was here in Arlington and, uh, that was great. If I could just stay at home and not have to buy, yeah. I mean, I'm already booked for Chicago, so I guess I'm. Yeah. That's my thing. If they're going to do that, Mike, and I'm not opposed, I'll, I'll redirect South to Texas and, and I'd be no, no qualms about it or, or arguments for me. If they're going to do that, I guess my only, my only thing I'd say is like, Let's do it sooner than later. Don't do it last minute when people may not be able to get out of arrangements or it may screw them up where they now they can't go. You know what right. I mean? Like, 
So um, I, I think you, you, if you want to be proactive, if that's something, uh, being that it has been a lot of shows in, in Texas, uh, even during the pandemic, and it's just a better, uh, better venue considering under the circumstances, then make that, to me, make that call sooner then later, you know what I mean? But well, we are in March, right? I mean, it's it's close. It's, yeah, oh, that's what I'm saying. Think, it'll be here before we know it, end of July. Yeah. And that you're right. I agree with you that if they are going to make that call, they should do it as soon as absolutely possible. Um, I mean, I'm going no matter what. So, I mean, I just love yeah. Nashville. It is an experience in the hobby. There's so many new people in the hobby. They don't even know what the national is all about. And yeah, my first one was 2019, believe it or not, for as long as I've been in the hobby, Mike, my first one was the Chicago one in 2019. I had visions of what I thought it would be like for never going. And you can throw those out the window until you get there. Like, Holy smoke. I call, I don't know if I'm the first person I should patent this Mike. And uh, uh, I don't know if I'm the first person. To, I call it the super bowl of yeah. the hobby. If you know anything about the Super Bowl, everyone is yeah, when, there. It, it, it's celebrities, athletes. Uh, it's just uh, the mecca. Uh, it's just that, that every year, everyone is anyone that's anyone uh, tries to go and, and tries to get there or gets there, and uh, it's just a, a a great event. And uh, you need to, you know, I went when I went in 2019. I was there four days. And I, I got, I, I would say I got probably 80% of taking it all in, but you, you, you gotta be there. You know, if you can be there the whole week, which was, is my plan this year. Uh, you know, that's what you need. You, you know, if you can do it at, that's your best bet because it's yeah, just I, so much I get going questions, on. I get questions about it and it's, what's it like? And I'm like, I can't describe it. You can't understand the scope of it. Yeah. You can't understand the size and the vastness of everything and how much different things you can see. I mean, if it exists, it'll be there yeah. and you'll see it. Yeah. You may not be able to afford it. That's for darn sure, but it'll be there. Uh, we actually bench clear media. We're going to have a booth this year uh, at the national yeah. great. Cause it'll be a place where I can park my stuff. <laughs> and that's the biggest thing. Uh, but we're, you know, it's just one of those things that nobody can understand until you go. I can't do it justice by trying to describe it to you. And I would tell people, if you can go for one day, you should still go. Just don't yeah. expect to get anything other than just a cursory look at what's going on. But if you, it, you really need at least three or four days to encompass the experience of the national uh, well, going for one day is better than not going at all. I will say that is yeah. absolutely true, but you're going to leave severely disappointed in, that you can't stay longer. Yeah, you, it's like leaving the fair early, you know, right. what I mean? <laughs> yeah. but no, you're right. You, you, the longer you can go the better, you know, the, the, even the four days I went, I felt like I, I missed something. I know I missed something, you know, it was, it was, I didn't know what I missed cause it was my first one, but I felt like, I didn't cover all the bases, uh, as they say, and so. Uh, what's your plan, favorite? What's your favorite well, night of the national, or day, or I'll, whatever? If if when it comes to buying stuff, I think you know your best bet. If you can stick around, if this this kind of goes for any show, Mike. I think you know where I'm going here. Is the last day? You know, people want to make those those last uh, sales, take less back with them. Uh, maybe if the show hasn't been. Great form. They they might be apt to sell something uh, a little cheaper. And so if if you're looking for some some deals at the end, it's it's Sunday. You know, but before, as people you know before they're just about to pack up. Um, the, the the day I came in on Thursday uh, late, so I don't even really count that. And so Friday was my first day, and uh, there in Chicago, I just. Uh, that day, I just walked around and, and met people that wanted to, to, to meet me and, and talk and, and hang out. Saturday, I did some some interviews for the show, and then Sunday was kind of shopping day. I, I, I didn't buy – I probably bought something, but I really kind of saved Sunday for, like, if you're going to buy anything, save it kind of for, for Sunday, you know. And so that's I what I did. Most of my spending, if you will, was was the last day. 
Yeah, I have actually a little bit different take, and I'll share it with your listeners. Yeah, is go ahead. My favorite day is Wednesday, and it's the sneak preview day. And the reason it is, and I agree with what you're saying about Sunday, by the way. I'm not disagreeing yeah. with that. But when I go, I want – think about by Sunday, it's all – it's gone. A lot of it's gone. Yeah, Wednesday, everything true. is there. I have everything. If I'm – like when the first year I went – or not the first year – uh, a couple of years ago when I went, uh, your most recent, one of your recent guests, Eric, those back pages and I walked around yeah. and I'm looking for a Hank Aaron rookie. And on Wednesday, I bought it on Wednesday. Well, I had every Hank Aaron rookie just about in the whole place for me to look at and choose from versus on Sunday, all the good ones have been quote unquote picked through maybe, right? Nothing's been picked yeah. through at this point. I have the entire uh, world as my oyster, so to speak on Wednesday and, and and Thursday too. So those early days are great. I think, again, it's just two different perspectives. Both are good, right? I, I just think. No, I think we're both, I think we're both right. I think we're yeah, both right. right. I think, I think the, the risk of waiting till Sunday is that you may miss out on a specific card that's gone or maybe in the, in the shape you wanted it, it's not available or the price you wanted it is is right. not available. So that's the risk. You know, anytime you wait, that's the you may miss out. So yeah, I think I think we're both I think we're both right. In my defense, I I, I didn't ever I haven't been to a, a preview day yet. So uh, it's awesome. I, I can't you gotta go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh it's and, really a great vibe on Wednesday. Everybody's excited. Yeah. You know, they're not yeah, tired yet. They're not Everyone's exhausted. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, believe it or not, I think dealers. I, and this will. Uh, what I'm curious to see this year, most of all, is how much dealing goes on. I never paid sticker price on a single item that I bought yeah. at any national I've ever been to. I don't know that that'll be the case now because they can just wait for someone else to come along, and someone's going to pay their price most likely. So I think they're going to be a lot more patient and not be willing yeah. to deal as much because there might be someone down the road that versus, Hey, I don't know if let's say I'm looking at a 71 tops Roberto Clemente or something. Well, I might be the only guy in the next three days that asks about that card. So they, they've been more inclined in the past to take the money bird in the hand, right? I'd rather have yeah. the money, maybe a little bit less than sticker to get this card sold. I need, I'm there to sell cards. I'm there to move yeah. inventory. That's their whole purpose. And so, It'll be interesting to see this year that dynamic, and I, I don't think the deals will be as great no matter when. No, I think you got a point there. I think here's the other thing: pandemic or no pandemic, the hobby's just uh, crazy right now. I think they're going to set. You know, I don't know what the you know the fire code, depending on where it's held, whether it stays in Chicago or is moved to to your neck of the woods, as they say. But they're going to have no shortage of people in in either case. And so, um, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how, you know, I've, I've even heard, I'm sure you've heard this too, that uh, you, they're almost going to sell tickets for, for time slots. Like, Hey, you can be in the, the building from 10 to two. And then this next group's coming in at two to five or two to six or whatever it is. Uh, um, I'm not a fan of that. I, I, you know, I don't know how you feel. I, I, I understand it given the circumstances and, and, and the pandemic, but you know, it's almost like, you know, when, when someone's traveling from out of state and in some cases out of country and uh, you, you know, I, I, I know they're not doing it to be mean. It's not that sort of tactic, but right. I just don't like, sort of the fact that hey you you leave you guys come in i i hope i hope they can get into a, a venue and maybe with the vaccine now some of the the early promising uh numbers that are coming back with the vaccine that we, in other words we could have potentially avoid that kind of scenario uh you know your kind of thoughts i'm sure you heard that and what, yeah how what, would what you believe you that I don't know how yeah. they would release that. How would you Unless kick they, out half the people? Uh, I mean, you probably have colored, the way I would guess, probably a colored band. So if we were in the early group and we had a blue colored band and, hey, you guys, all right, you guys, are, your time's up. And then it comes the orange bands, you know, the people with the the orange bands. You know? I think it'll so, also make the VIP 
tickets even more valuable because they get in a little bit early every day. I doubt they would do that to the VIP holders. It'll be probably yeah. the single day ticket guys, people that are buying single day tickets that they would put the time slot thing on. So the, I think the VIP becomes even more valuable. You and I are lucky or, I mean, I'm going to have a booth and I also have a media pass. So I being a YouTube guy, I, I get a media pass. So I get to be there. Yeah. Whenever. yeah. I'll have a meet. I had a media pass in, in yeah. 2019. So that, that's, that's nice. Cause you get in earlier before everyone else does that. That was a, a, a real nice uh, perk of, of that. And, uh, you know, so yeah, that, that I just, I, I hate to see, I'm not even just speaking for myself, just in general. I, I hate to see, Hey, you guys got to leave or your time's up. I'm not, you know, I hope that I, I get if they have to do it. I understand why. I just hope we can avoid Me that too. scenario if, if possible. And if if that's moving it to Dallas or Houston, then move it to Dallas. And, you know, with all due respect, the people in Chicago are probably listening right now saying, what are you saying, John? Terrible. I'm not listening to you ever again. You, you know, I love Chicago. It's not a, it's not a it's not a Chicago thing. It's like, listen, I, I it's it stinks. We're we're in this pandemic, but let's do, you know, and, and eventually I, I, we're, we're going to be on the, the, the other side of it where, you know, the, the protocols would be very, a lot less than we're, we're dealing with. And so if we have to move it this year to, to accommodate more people and, and not be limiting to, to access, then I'll sign up for that. Now people in Chicago like, well, I don't want, I'm, I'm, you know, I want it here and I get it. I would too, probably if I was in Chicago, but uh, as someone who's in, from, in New York, I just, I don't, I just want to have as less perimeter. You know, I wanted everyone to be safe. I'm not saying like, Hey, let's just act like nothing's going on. But at the same time, the less limitations we can have where everyone that wants to enjoy uh, what I call the Super Bowl, the hobby, Let's all be able to do it uh, without sort of time constraints, if you will. And, you know, I, I had Chris Carlin on on the Hobby Hotline, which is a Saturday morning show. And uh, that was this, this past week. And he said, as of right now, uh, I was a little surprised. I didn't know. They said Upper Deck is not uh, planning on attending uh, the National. And he said, you might be surprised. There might be a few other companies that, that make – that decision with their employees. I was a little sh shocked, you know? And so I just, I hope we get, I, I know it's, we're in the pandemic. I just hope we get as close to a, a normal, if you will, I, you know, the sort of national as, as we can. And again, if that's moving it to, you know, if moving it to Dallas allows upper deck to attend or, or another company, then, then you have to do it, you know? And well, Dallas, and, think about this. If moving it means we get to have it, we should move it. They should move yeah. it. If it's yeah. we either cancel it, I mean, that's not, that shouldn't even be on the table. They've already done that. So it's either move yeah. it, just make sure we can have it somewhere. And Dallas yeah. makes a lot of sense. I mean, Panini's here. Uh, Beckett is here. You know, there's a lot of logic to a, a North Texas national. Uh, it always amazed, not to cut you off, Mike, it always yeah. amazed me. Why you didn't have one there just anyway? Like it's the sort of the the try, you know. It's sort of the heart. I hate to say it like that, but probably the heart of the hobby. Where, like, why isn't it? I'm not saying every year. That's not necessarily for the, the other venue. Yeah, you know, I'd love to see the Nationals just kind of East Coast, Central, uh, you know, Southwest, and and Dallas is perfect with, like you said, with all the major companies. I like to see it sort of. You know, whether it be three or four or five cities, whatever you, you settle on, just sort of like the, you know, this year we're here, this year we're here, this year right. we're here. It you used know, to Dallas, be yeah, Dallas, you're going to be, you know, 2021, 2026, 2031. You can kind of even plan years in advance uh, uh, ahead, and, you know, Atlantic City or whatever. I'm a New York City kid. Uh, I, I know there's a lot of issues there with, with parking and, and venues. But I'd love to see it. Uh, I know some people are like hearing me and saying no, but uh, I'd love to see it. Uh, you know, be in New York. I'm I'm not in New York anymore, city, 
but I'm only 200 miles away. So that's, and I have family there. So it would be uh, perfect for me, but I, I'll travel too. But I like to see, I mean, when you think, I mean, for, you know, Tops is in, in Brooklyn. And, and so I'd love to see it, uh, you know, in, in the city as well. California for those folks on the West Coast. They, I almost feel bad for them. They have to do most of the traveling like all the time, whether it's in Chicago or Atlantic City. Uh, you know, or where have you, um, they're doing the most uh, traveling. I like to see it sort of everyone sort of get it in their neighborhood, so to so to speak, and uh, that way no one can gripe, hey, uh, it never comes here. I don't, we're not there yet. I'm, I'm sure there's reasons uh, for that, uh, logistically, venues, hotels, parking. There's a lot, you know, people don't realize all the different things that go into these major uh, events, and if one thing doesn't jive it can throw the whole thing uh where it ain't gonna happen and so you know it's one thing's for sure like you said i think it's you know even even during the pandemic i've heard some people say i'm I'm not going until this thing's over and i respect uh people's personal beliefs and opinions Uh, i still think it's going to probably set attendance records if it's allowed to and if those people can all be there and uh you know, uh, it just it, it'll be interesting. You know, uh, the, the 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 nationals interesting and under normal circumstances. I think it, uh, it it's all the more interesting. Uh, you know, I wish we weren't in the pandemic, but it's going to be interesting to see where this thing winds up uh, and and how the logistics how how it goes down. You know, For sure. But like you said, you, I don't think you can cancel it a second year in a row. Not when you you're seeing other shows and you know there's been a couple sh- some shows in Dallas uh, you know one was called like the de facto national. And so huge, you huge shows yeah, yeah you can't you you know what I mean I, I understand safety. I don't want to sound insensitive but you know whatever how you have to put it on like you said you, I think you gotta do it. I don't think you want to go two years uh without having one I, I, you know Right. I agree. So, so you're big into grading. I, I'm big into grading. Uh, I saw you recently did a video where you, you stacked up all your graded cards. I used to think I had a lot. And then I saw that video and uh, realized like, I better, I better buy some more. So talk about <laughs> things, things that make you spend more, <laughs> more money. So you have well, quite the, the inventory, um, you know, I don't apologize for, for being active in grading. I've said on my show when grading first really uh, hit the scene, I thought it was kind of a, a fad that would fade. Uh, I'd be the first person to say I was wrong. I'm, I'm wrong a lot of times. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, uh, I, I, I grade cards. I buy cards graded. I submit. And, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a hot button t- topic. People who don't like grading – or don't submit cards, sort of, I don't know how I want to word, but I think, you know, when they might take some shots. They really kind of, um, you know, uh, complain or, or just tell people who grade like me and you how it's silly, it's stupid, you know, you're throwing your money out, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and I don't know where it comes from. Um, you know, kind of your thoughts as someone who's been in, uh, in the grading for a while. You know, have you have you caught that from from even if, maybe not so much in person, but just on on social media or comments? You know, yeah. people who are anti grading, if you will. It's funny. It's uh, I felt the same way you did early in the grading. In my grading experience, was this is it? Like, why do I want to pay somebody else money to grade my card? I don't care. Well, I started caring because I started buying higher dollar cards and I, it was more of an authenticity thing for me. I wanted, like, I couldn't tell as long as I've been doing this, it's hard to tell some of the fakes sometimes and not that PSA or any of none of them are perfect by any stretch, but it's still at least another set of eyes beyond just mine determining a, is this card real and B what do they have in it? What's their opinion on what the condition is and what the, Funny thing as I get comment wise is I might buy a certain card in a PSA four and they're like, Oh, why didn't you just save up and buy the eight or what and buy a bigger, a better grade? And I'm like, dude, I just want the card. I want a real yeah. card, a nice example. And we all have hobby budgets. I don't, you know, there's only yeah. some of them 
there's always somebody with a bigger boat, but at the same time, we all have a number that we, I can't just spend whatever I want on cards in any given month. And so I have to go, well, if I can get four cards of a lower grade than one card in a nicer grade, the whole quantity versus quality thing, I'm going to take, I'm just, this is just the way I collect. I, I want the quantity. I want the different cards. I want four in lower grades than the one in a great grade because it's not about the money, right? It's yes. The one in the great grade could probably appreciate more in value, but I'm not selling it anyway. So what do I care? And yeah, that's the way I look at the hot at, at grading. I love it. Uh, I love, we did an interview, Ty did an interview on bench clear media. If you've never, if you haven't seen it with uh, Tyler from hybrid grading approach HGA, they are, yeah. hit, they are, hitting it hard and they are storming in now PSA is going to be the big dog for, for yeah people. here's here's my thing Mike too with HGA and, and I, I haven't had Tyler on and, and I know he's claiming and again you know autumn fully automated I, I to me I gotta see it like anyone can say they're doing that I'm not saying he's not doing it I'm just saying when you're new I think you got to show your hand I think if PSA or BGS said, "Hey, we're, we're we've incorporated uh, automation into our process. I think they they have a little more street cred where someone's not going to say, you know, baloney, show us or we don't believe you. I think with with HGA, with all due respect, you know, um, I want to see that because I, you know, I think when you're when you're sort of the new kid on the block and you make that claim, and I hope it's true. I'm not rooting against uh, the the company, but like I think your the onus is on you as someone who's new to the space to to show that that's the actual fact. It's you yeah, know, but you have, to admit, you have to admit competition is good, right? And no, no, I'm all I'm all for that. I'm all for and I you know the three I use are uh, PSA, Beckett, and SGC, and uh, probably more PSA and, and SGC recently. And uh, this let's be real, the HGA slabs are probably some of the sharpest and, and most attractive uh, on the market right now. I mean, they're, they're, they're sharp. Uh, uh, you know, we were probably given an award show for like best slab. They probably win it. All I'm saying, I guess, Mike is like, if they are automated, I'm not saying they aren't. I just, to me, when you make that claim as a new company, I think the onus is sort of like to show it. And I know, yeah. I get it. He's been asked, uh, not by me, but he's been asked by other people to, hey, can we see the process? And there's always sort of been, I don't want to use, maybe excuse is not the right word, a reason I can't do it right now. And I just, well, I if, don't you know, have, just uh, if you have some proprietary method that you're using to I, do this, you want to protect that. You don't want to just I, put I, it out there. I get yeah. it. But you think PSA with their, their coffers, is, you know what I mean? Can't do something on there. Like, I don't think PSA is going to look, uh, and I'm using them as an example. There's sure. others too. Is going to look at that and say, man, we can't come up with that. He's got the, like the seek, you know, the Colonel Sanders secret recipe. You know, I don't think it's, uh, and again, I don't know. It's easy for me to play armchair grading company CEO. I, I get it. And I, I understand that if someone's saying, Hey, you know, that's easy for you to say, John, you're, it's not your property or like, uh, you know, Mike said, for, you know, your propriety uh, on the program or on the software. And so I, I get it or show at least something. I'm not saying you just, you know, completely yeah, open the door, but show us some facet that this is how the process is going. Because I mean, I could come on the air tomorrow and say, you know, two days ago, me and my son started a fully automated grading company, right? We didn't, but I said it, right? And and some people might believe it. Most probably wouldn't. But I, I, I guess what I'm saying is when you're kind of new, and maybe it's not, I'm not even saying it's fair. I'm not even saying the, the premise is fair. It probably isn't. But when you're new and you kind of, stake that claim you sort of gotta to me show something that it's actual you know truth to it rather than just a statement i, I think if psa even sgc or, or beckett said hey starting in in 
you know, April 1st, we're, we're doing automation in, in these terms. You know, some people would probably say, hey, what, show us what it is. Uh, maybe even me. But I think they could get away with it more, I guess, saying we're, this is what's happening. And, and less people say, show me. We, they would just say, hey, they, they got the, the funds and the finances and the wherewithal. They're doing it. When you're new, the new kid on the block, I, someone like me might say, all right, you know, it's it's like weight room, right? You know, you, you, some, hey, I can bench 450, right? No, you can't. Well, let's go to the weight room. Oh, man, I, I got a doctor's appointment after school. I got to go, right? It's it maybe not the best analogy right there, Mike, but it's along funny. those lines. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I, I I mean, think, if you don't yeah, think, I mean, come on, PSA with Nat Turner and the new investment group, they that's one of the first things I think they're going to figure out is how yeah. to, and look, they have raised prices, right? That's the news uh, when we're recording this that came out yeah. today that they essentially doubled all of their submission yeah. prices. And they are doing, I, my opinion, they have done that to stop the flow of card. They do not want any more cards or if they yeah. are, Cards they're going to get, yeah. they're going to mint on them. I just no. I think you're exactly right, but I, I think that business model is is sort of funny. Like raise prices so we get less business. But if you said that in most, you know, if you just put that as a general business statement, so, uh, you know, most people would economists would say, well, what are you trying to do? Go out of business. But for the grading, it's it's a whole monster of its itself. And I think you're exact. That is why they're doing it. Let's be let's be real. I don't necessarily like it. I understand it, um, but you know, I, I mean, I guess it's easy again. Plain armchair CEO grader uh, of great. You know, me. I would just say, why were you not sort of prepared a little bit better for this kind of intake? I I, I don't think you can ever be prepared what we're seeing in the in the grading space. I, I, I'll give them that much. But, you know, SGC got buried when when PSA and, and Becca was shut down and they thought they were prepared for it and uh, not so not so much. And, uh, yeah. you know, so, I mean, they're all no one's immune. I, I'm, I'm not picking on anyone. I just. You know, I, I, I don't know what the answer is. That's that's the, the funny thing. But I, I just hate the fact that it's raising prices is, is the answer uh, for that that problem. You know, I well, just I don't think, think I don't think it's forever. I really don't. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But how often do you see them say, OK, we're lowering prices back down? I, I, I'm I don't know that they'll you know, do it, you know, carte blanche across the board but i think they'll start offering more specials and you know there used to be you could grade cards for 550 a card 450 a card right and mm -hmm. if you look at the hga model which i'm not look, i'm not a, i've never sent cards to hga in full disclosure i i think it's a cool idea i like the idea of adding competition not just any competition i want to see competition that makes a cool I, I like their slabs too i happen to like their flips there i know it's very divisive in the community some people hate them they hate the colors and all i think it's super cool actually uh i think it's neat but i've never yeah. sent any parts to them so I'm, I'm just putting that out there but i think that you know them coming in if you look at their pricing it's fixed it's not i've never understood this and maybe john you can answer this for me or maybe somebody out there can why does psa put a value limit on up to 499 does it cost more money to grade a ten thousand dollar card than it does a two hundred dollar it's the same process you, i i know you you know you said you listen to the show i know you listen to the show when yeah. you're saying that because yeah i've said that for i don't for get it a while like up charges like it's yeah. like you 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 said it perfectly you're looking you're grading one card it should take well however long it takes if you're taking 20 minutes to give me my grade or 10 minutes to give me my grade. It's still one card. I don't care if it's a Jose Akendo or a LeBron James tops Chrome rookie. Like just say what condition you, you've assessed it in. Like, yeah, you're, you're penalizing me or, or others for having a good card. Like we're going to just right. milk you. It's, I'm like the golden cow, right? I got a, a, a fourth, a $5,000 LeBron James card. So we're just going to, 
squeeze I'm like an orange. Just get all the juice out of me you can. You know, I don't think that's really I don't think that's really fair, you know. Um but HGA doesn't have that. They are no, if you and send I, in I, cards, that's, it's thirty five bucks. It should be. They no should matter all, what it is. Upcharges are the biggest. Whatever. I've heard people actually just come right out and call it a scam, Mike. Uh, I'll yeah. go right to that that line and sort of straddle it. Uh, I think it's baloney, uh, you know. Um, and uh, you know, I mean, and and that that's a whole gray area, you know. Where you say, well, this card. Did, what about those cards that are sort of borderline, right? And um, I don't know, man. I just think charge per card, whatever the charge is, that's you set the, the pricing right. and it's up to us. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll grade it for 20 bucks or 25 or if, if we want it faster, 200 or whatever, you know, depending on what it is, uh, but not Hey, we got this and man, that's a great card. Now it's going to cost you $300 more. Like, like they do the same thing that? on, they do the same thing on autograph authentications too. It's yeah, the same deal. Like, I, I hate it. I'm not going to mince words. I I, yeah. I I know you don't like it either. Like, you know, pay, pay you know, you, you know, you buy a hand, you know, you go to a restaurant, you order a meal, it, the price is on the menu, right? They don't say, man, the chef did a great job with your steak. I know it says 35, but it's going to be $50 now. This is probably one of the better steaks he's made here. And uh, we we'll have to upcharge you for, it, you know, I, so, I just, I don't get it. Uh, you know, it's just, it, I don't know. It's just silly. Uh, I, it amazes me that, you know, uh, people still do it as much, but uh, listen, when you, when you're the, the leader in the, in the space, you can probably get away with that more than if you weren't. Uh, I think that's what it, it proves, um, you know, and uh, I like, I, you know, what, what, what you know, you, with Nat Turner acquiring it and his investment group, um, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, man, he's going to he's, he's a collector like us. He's going to uh, fix a lot of the things we feel, you know, and I said on my show and I'm not, you know, I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying Nat Turner is a bad guy. Actually, from all accounts, he's a, a really good no down earth guy, but no he builds businesses. Right. He's he's there. You know, and now it's not like he just went in himself. He's got a whole bunch of other people who put their money uh, in there with him. And I think it'd even be a little different if it was all 100% on that Turner. That's not what this is. And and so I always I told people pump the brakes here. I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think this is going to be like a knight riding in on a white horse to fix all the ills that we, we, we say there are. And, uh, you know, maybe some of them, hopefully, uh, you know, I, I was hoping one of the things he would do is someone who probably maybe got some of those upcharges on, on, on his stuff before he was, uh, took over was I thought maybe come in and say, listen, we might raise prices like we saw today, Mike, but the subcharge business is going away. You, you pay the price level and that's it. Whether you have a LeBron James or you have, you know, uh, a Matthias Thibel, you know what I mean? It's yeah. you paid for the card, we grade the card. Uh, if it's $200 quick turnaround or the $25 when we can get it back to you, it's one card either way. And uh, uh, I, he could still do that. I'm not, I'm not closing the book on that, but I'm not sure that's going to happen. You know, might have been just wishful thinking. Uh, on on my part, but uh, and maybe others too. But uh, I just was when when this whole thing went down, I was sort of like, wait and see. I'm not gonna just you know hook line and sinker say this is really what's going on here. This is a a huge company, a huge enterprise, a huge money making uh, enterprise, and uh, you know when you have that many people involved with their money, uh, he's answering. To a few people, I know they're privatized now, so it's not the same thing as answering necessary the shareholders. But in a sense, it is because those people who invested with him are shareholders, I uh, want to private on shareholders. Effort. Yeah, and so they're still shareholders. It's just not me and you going to E Trade and buying stocks of Collectors Universe. Uh, now they're just people who've put a good sum of money uh, into that pot and. Uh, like you said, they you know they care about what comes back. 
you know, maybe not even right away, but eventually. And sure. so um, it'll be interesting to see today's news. You know, uh, uh, I didn't take it as good news. Um, I, 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 you know, in, in life where everything goes up from your cable bill to your electric bill, I always like to see one thing not do that. And, uh, you know, not the case uh, today. I get, like you said, I understand why I, I get it. They're trying to catch up and that's, that part's good. I just think, you know, the, is there a way to do it without, you know, uh, that much of an increase across the board? And, you know, I, I don't know. I'm, there's, I'm sure there's smart people in that room and that's still what they, they came up with. So it is what it is, as, as the New York saying goes, you know, and, right. uh, you know, as consumers, we have choices to make now. I think, I think what, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get your take as we kind of come down the stretch here. You know, someone asked me today, what do you think? You know, there was a lot of people, I think, upset and, and some uh, that weren't as much and said, here's why. And this, uh, this is good. It'll stop those base cards, you know, from, from being submitted. And, uh, but I think more were upset and, you know, a few people, uh, you know, private message me and said, what do you think happens with this? And the PSA is still going to do well. I just think you're going to see um, some of the other companies, whether that's HGA, definitely SGC. Uh, you got CSG now as well uh, uh, going live. I think you're going to see them uh, get an influx of more cards. And then, and then the onus is on them. How are they going to handle the, the, the huge uh, increase of cards uh, going through their door. Uh, and, uh, you know, if they can do a good job getting those back quickly into the hobbyist hands, you know, PSA might have, it might get interesting there. If what happens is what happened with SGC, you know, five, six months ago, um, then PSA probably doesn't have to worry as much because, uh, you know, uh, they, they can't handle the, the, you know, the overflow. And so, We'll we'll see. I mean, that's that's my take. I think it's it's going to trickle down. Some people aren't going to submit uh, to PSA, uh, and uh, these other companies are going to benefit from that. How do they handle it? Is probably uh, the bigger question. Well, you mentioned earlier how how does any business raise their prices and expect to stay in business? And I would let me let me give you this analogy to think about as we kind of wrap up here. If I could tell you, John, and this is goes for anybody out there, that you could work half as hard, or like half as long, but make the same salary. That's essentially what PSA is doing. They're going to get less cards, but they're going to make more, twice as much per card. They can take in half as many cards, have half as much work, and make the same revenue. And yeah. that's what they've just, they if we would all take that deal. I'm going to work half as hard, but make the same salary. That's a great deal for PSA, they can catch up, they can, they can, that'll give them some bandwidth to do some new technology to maybe do some innovations on the, on the grading side. That's going to give them that ability and still maintain their revenue. They're not necessarily probably going to go up in revenue. They, we may be surprised who knows six months from now, they're still getting record submissions, even at double the price. I simply don't think that's going to happen. It's, if I'm one guy, I'm like, I'm not submitting anymore for a long time because I don't, it's too much. And so I think they're, they're being very, again, you said it, they have a lot of smart people in that room and they're going, look, we're going to work half as hard, be able to reallocate resources to other things and make the same amount. Now we're going to make the same amount of money for a while because we're going to lose half our submit. People are going to send in half as many cards, let's say or maybe even less than that, but they will still, they're not answering to the public anymore. The private shareholders yeah. are going, look, we're, we'll, we're willing, if I'm a private shareholder, if I'm Nat Turner, I would say, look, let's take a step. I'll, I'm willing to take a step back for a year or two so that later we can take five steps forward and do all these wonder, because I'm not a short, shareholders, public shareholders think short term. They want to see next quarter's earnings. And they want to make sure that that's continuing to increase. As a longer term private investor, you have a totally different mindset. You're thinking, remember, this is what I do for a living, John. So I'm not yeah. just completely no, talking you're, about no, I, Yeah, no, I but hear you. You have a much longer term perspective. You're like, I care what it is 10 years from now, not what it is next quarter. And so I'm willing, 
and they all had to agree on this price. Like there was no, this isn't like somebody woke up one day, Steve Sloan woke up today and decided to raise prices. This has been a long time coming or at least a little while coming and them thinking about it. Seriously, like what's the ramifications of this if we do this and they're going, we're going to take a step back so that later we can take three steps forward. That is where I think they're going. What does that look like? I don't know. None of us know. I'd love to get Nat yeah. Turner on the show and have a nice talk with him. But uh, yeah, it's good. No, for, I, I think, think it's good for the hobby, honestly. Yeah, I, I think I well, I think you're right. I think that's the, why it happened. I just I guess I don't like the fact that it happened as someone who submits. Sure. You know what I, I you know what I think happens, Mike? I think you, I think you're going to see it, you know, uh, people just buy. Uh, tell me if you agree with this. I think cards that are already slabbed, you know, on whatever platform you want to say there, my slabs, eBay, ComC, you, you name the selling platform, people are going to go out and search for them and say, hey, you know, I, I might have this card uh, in a nine or 10, but by the time I, you know, I submit it, it's going to cost this. I might get upcharged. Uh, we talked about that. Well, why don't I just buy someone else's who already went through this process? It'll probably be cheaper to do that, even though I have the card in raw form sitting on my desk. Absolutely. I'll go, maybe I'll send that to SGC for 20 bucks and buy the, the card uh, from a platform for $400 and, instead of having the whole process maybe cost me uh, more than that to, to submit my own card. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's... My my yeah, three thousand yeah. plus labs all just went up in value incrementally today. Thank you, yeah. C Sloan. You know, not a lot. I don't think it's but there's a marginal difference now because you can go, God, it's gonna cost me fifty bucks or whatever to get this graded. And I just think you're gonna see a lot of the base cards and and lesser cards, so to speak, in terms of raw value, just not get submitted anymore. The LeBron James rookies and the Kobe's and all that, those are all yeah. still gonna the Lucas are all gonna yeah. get still submitted because it's worth it right? It's, yeah. it's still worth it. And I, who said it? I don't know if it was you or I heard it somewhere today that they are now taking, they want some of that money that slabbing a card, that a pre instant appreciation of getting the right grade of getting a 10. They want some of that money themselves. They're like, I don't want it to just to go to this person that kind of like Panini and doing their Dutch auction stuff. You know, they just wanted some of that yeah. secondary market money. I guess is what, and I don't, I don't know. I don't say I like that either. That's to me, that's just pure greed. And that's not what this hobby should be about to me. It should be about yeah. relationships and fun and nostalgia and connecting. And that's what this hobby, it's a hobby for crying out loud people. It's a yeah. hobby. No, I agree uh, with you. All the time, but sorry. I digress. You know what? Yeah. No, you know what I think, Mike, I think, you know what? I think people have more of the problem. Tell me if you even agree with this. I think, I think people are willing to bite the bullet on the financials, the money, if they didn't have to wait seven, eight months. So if if I, I guess what you know, like you said here, they're doing this to, to create uh, uh, less cars coming in so they can catch up. If they can pull, I guess what I'm saying is, if they pull this off and people get their cards back uh, in, in better times, people are gonna, uh, uh, you know take it better the price increase if this price increase happens which it is not if it is happening and and yet the times are still the same or worse or not significantly better that's where i think they could get i don't want I don't, maybe troubles too strong a word or psa it'll, it'll here, shoot themselves in the foot yeah you're yeah, right yeah I, I mean they could lose some i'll put it this way maybe not trouble, but they can lose some of their market share that they're accustomed to having. It can, it can erode away a little bit. And so uh, if you're doing something to cut down on the times and that doesn't happen and, and that doing something is raising prices and then it doesn't happen, that's where you look bad, you know? And so they don't look bad yet, sort of, I mean, just from past history, but this, this is a decision that had just happened today so we gotta we gotta let you know let the, the chips let fall when they may let, let the simmer. hand play out yeah and so it'll be interesting you know like you said let's see how this goes and then sort of you know whatever time frame you want to put let's you know reevaluate five six months and see how this decision sort of played itself out before we kind of 
uh, you know, give our, our grade on it. If our own, we'll grade them, you know what I mean? On their decisions. So it sounds like I just need to come back on your show and we can reevaluate. I think we, I, I think we, go. I think it's a date. I think it's a date. So <laughs> <laughs> I just got myself I, invited back. Cause I brought Yeah, That's how we just got to keep talking about grading. We'll, 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 we'll do one a month, but uh, you, you know, it's just, it's such a hot button topic that, uh, you know, even let's be real, even people who don't participate in grading uh, still comment on let's, you know, I still see people comment on it, uh, get upset about it. Uh, you know, so some of the folks complain about the price hikes, don't even grade cards. They're just complaining because it's a price hike. And right. so, you know, it's it's just it's funny how grading sort of uh, affects it. And it does affect everyone because, you know, I think we both can agree that some of the grading decisions affect some of the values or what raw cards are going to now cost. You know, I saw sure. someone on social media today say that I expect raw cards to actually increase in value uh maybe even on, a, on like a platform like star stock where they give those uh great assessments without them being officially graded a star stock a may all of a sudden be worth a whole lot more you know sure it'll be, it's so much there's so many repercussions from you know what happened today that you know if you if you if you're having fun in the hobby it's going to be interesting to see you know you know, that's the beauty to me of the hobby, Mike. I've said this numerous times on the show, is what happens next. It's almost like it's almost like a, a, a show on TV and like you know, it's a 30 minute show and they, they leave you, they don't end it, right? They're like, stay tuned next week to see the outcome. It's, that's sort of where the hobby is now, is hey, this happened, and then you gotta watch the next episode to find out you know, yeah. the end result. And it's fun. You know, I guess some people want instant gratification. aren't going to like it, but someone who like you or me, that's been in it this long and we plan to stick around. We're, we're willing to wait and see. So, uh, be interesting to say the least. So, it's but, exciting. uh, look, yeah, I definitely, you know, we already, we already said it. We'll have you back on. I want to thank you, uh, for coming on and, 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 you know, bringing your insight, especially from the financial side, uh, of things which I think is important. Like you said, I, you might not do it in yourself or, or me either for the financials, but there's there's an aspect of the hobby that definitely is that we can't deny it. And so no doubt. Uh, bring, in, bring in your expertise uh, over. I, I appreciate it. You bet. All right, Mike. Uh, I'll, hopefully I'll see you. I'll see you at the national. Maybe I'll be in, maybe apparently I might be in Texas. We're, we're here. And so, <laughs> Wouldn't hurt my feelings. I love it. <laughs> you can come over here and come into the into my card room and check out. The yeah, beast. I got to see the beast. <laughs> That's right. The beast. That's right. right the beast. It. For those listening, for that maybe don't know, or the few of you that exist, uh, it, it's really it's a it's I, I don't know I, it's like a card catalog, literally like a you'd see in the library. But that's where Mike has all his his graded card inventory. Really cool and. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people out there trying to find find one after seeing yours. No, my dad and I custom built it. We custom oh, built it. Oh, you did? I oh, yeah. oh, okay. I was gonna say I wouldn't. Yeah, you're right. That were like the ones yeah. you would see in like a, a I would not fit. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's we used cool. it as we used that card catalog idea. That was my inspiration yeah. for it. And I, none of them that I found worked properly. So my dad and I. My dad's an amazing woodworker and. He has a yeah. met talent there, and I took my idea and translated it, and we worked on it together. It was a great father-son project. The memories yeah. are awesome, and I have this beautiful piece of furniture now that looks pretty darn good, and it's very functional, and it holds about yeah. 4,000 slabs. So. I was going to say, and but after seeing you lay them out on the table, there might need to be a Beast Part 2. There might be. A, the, the, beast, the Beast yeah, the Beast 2.0 <laughs> right. coming soon. So. Get the, all right, Mike. Hey, stay safe, stay healthy, and like I said, we'll we'll see you uh, somewhere, even if it's back on the show here in a, a a couple months, and just we'll kind of revisit sort of what we we discussed today. I'd love to, John. Thank you. All right, take care.